Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. And we're very glad to have uh, Professor Khan Jitian visiting us from uh, Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. We were lucky that he was uh, also coming to the U.S. for other uh, professional reasons and that we got him to stop by New Haven. And um, he is in the, uh, he's a lecturer in the International Relations Department um, at Chulalongkorn, and he's a sociologist by training. So I won't do a, a long introduction. He has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He works on migration, refugees, um, things of you know close interest for, for all of us. So I won't do a long introduction because we'd like to hear from him. Uh, so um, Professor Jitian, please take it away. All right. Um, thank you, Mufik, for the introductions. And then um, good afternoon, everyone. To those of you in the room and also those of you who join our live, yes, soon. Uh, I'm honored to, to have opportunities to to give these lectures as part of the fall seminar series of the Yale's programs on refugees and false migrations, false displacement, and also humanitarian responses. And I'm particularly grateful to, to Mujfik for, for the invitations, to Teresa, who is here with us, to Tarana, um, Marcus, Courtney, and also Alin, who helped with the arrangement um, for my visit to your campus today. Um, before delving into my, my talk for today, please allow me to, to give to preliminary precautions, which I think are worthwhile to mention beforehand. First, English is not my native tongue, so I may have difficulties conveying some thoughts concisely on these challenging subjects, but I will try my very best. And, and additionally, I speak very fast and often get faster so when I get nervous, mm -hmm. so making me known as a rapper among my students. So besides, I, I still have jet lag from traveling you know, 13 hours ahead of time to be here with you. So these combined reasons may perhaps help justify my reading of, of these talks for today. Second, this lecture is based on one of my working papers, which I started three years ago, but I still have not been able to finish it. And every time, you know, when I get back to, to work on this particular paper, there will always be a new additions to my endless thoughts and also my thinkings. And then I start moving forward. Perhaps it was for these reasons that I decided to give a talk based on this working paper, hoping that I will be able to finish it eventually. And I'm not saying this to, to actually manage or to diminish your expectations, but I mentioned this in the hope of, of garnering your thoughts and feedback for me to improve this particular paper. For those of you who may not be familiar with Bangkok or Thailand and the refugee situations there, please allow me to provide some context and factual information about the cities and countries which can help the foundations for my lectures today. First, Thailand is a country located in Southeast Asia with Bangkok being its capital. Thailand has approximately 70 million people, around 15% of whom or around 10.5 million live in Bangkok. And if we include in adjacent provinces, which form the Bangkok metropolitan areas, the entire population will increase to approximately 15 to 16 million people. Second, among millions of people living in the Bangkok metropolitan areas are thousands of urban refugees from at least 44 countries. The official data from the UNSCR office in Bangkok suggests that there are 5,000 of them. However, based on the observations of both CSO and also my own research team, we think that the actual number of refugees should be between 5,000 and 20,000 people. The major countries of origins for urban refugees in Bangkok, including Pakistan, Vietnam, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sri Lanka, and also Palestine. These groups of urban refugees that I will discuss are just these groups of people. My talk will not include the new arrivals from Myanmar, whose situation is more complicated and complex, but please feel free to ask questions related to them during the Q&A later. Third, Thailand is one of those countries in South and Southeast Asia, which are not, which are a non-signatory states to the 1951 conventions relating to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol. However, it has a long history of refugee management. Thailand also allows UNSCR to conduct refugee status determination or ISD. But the irony is that the Thai government does not recognize the UNSCR card for the refugee status. And just before the COVID-19 pandemic started, Thailand enacted its first refugee law to, deter to determine the status of those 
who generally need protections. The mechanisms has become known as the National Screening Mechanisms, or NSM. The mechanism has not yet been enforced since the eligibility the eligibility criteria that I was part of drafting committee just got approved by the cabinet last week. The fact that Thailand is a non-signatory state and the NSM is not yet operating, refugees continue to be illegal migrants, the terms that the Thai Immigration Bureau used to refer to these groups of people. Officially, refugees are subjected to arrest and detention. And just on the day I arrived in the US, 12 of them from the Khmer Rom community were arrested and detained in the immigration detention center. Thus, as several scholars of refugees in Thailand have criticized and illustrated, it is not an exaggeration to say that urban refugees in Bangkok continue to live in fear and also in a, a very hostile environment. My lectures today will highlight a parallel situations in which refugee asylums in Bangkok continues to be possible. Despite what I describe as fear or hostile environment just now. More importantly, urban refugees continue to arrive in Bangkok, regardless of the difficulties they may face or endure in the cities. And let me start my lectures today with some anecdotes. Here's how, we, here's how the story began. So while conducting fieldwork in Bangkok in December, 2018, I had an opportunity to meet Junior, a Hmong refugees teen through a local lawyer at the church near Don Muir International Airport. At the time of our encounters, the lawyer did not inform me who Junior really was, apart from saying that he was a community volunteer. As the teenagers walked toward us, Junior greeted me with a Y, a Thai gestures and introduced himself in Thai. Junior greeted me and say, Thai. His Thai was flawless. And I could not help thinking that he was a local Irish staff working for the law, for the lawyer's office. Only after our conversation a few minutes later, I realized I was wrong. Junior is a refugee registered with UNSCR who has come to live in Thailand since he was a boy together with his family of six. He was the second child of the Hmong pastor who fled to Thailand due to religious persecution in Northern Vietnam. His Thai was flawless because of he did go to the Thai primary school before quitting to help earn income for his family. Junior also speak Thai with his siblings and friends in the same community and at home. However, Junior has continued to be able to speak his native tongue, Hmong. He also learned English at the church and his father's encouraged him to study Chinese. His language skills landed him a job as a translator for various refugee organizations where he continued to work nowadays. Since our first encounter, I have become a frequent visitor to Junior's family and his community. I participated in some of their activities and learned several remarkable insights from their experiences and livelihoods in Bangkok. And let me mention a few. Junior's father, the pastor, is at the core of the, of the community. He's not only a spiritual guide, but also a community leader who plays a role in structuring the exiled community. At the end of Sunday Mass, he often took the opportunity to foster community spirit and unity. In the absence of justice in Thailand due to their lack of legal status, in the absence of access to justice, talks, my apologies, the pastors and some key community members serve as the elders who adjudicate community conflicts and familial disputes. The elders also play an essential role in bringing employment opportunities to community members. They leverage their social network primarily to the Hmong people who have already been living in Thailand for decades and from the previous employers to get people to work. Not everyone is employed. Although they can get jobs, I must note, I must note that these jobs are available in the informal sectors with no legal contracts. This includes a translation job that Junior has as well. The home of the pastors and the church serve as a community centers where community activities occur before the COVID-19 pandemic. While adults and teens would go to mass on Sunday, the second floor of the home of the pastors would turn into a nursery where volunteers would come and teach English to young kids. The first floor of the house also served as a community workshop where ladies would go and engage in making handicrafts and products like this. Some of these are all are sold through the Chamlin projects 
established by local refugee organizations to empower female refugees. Despite opportunities, the Hmong communities also face challenges because of they say illegally in Thailand. Raids and arrests still affect community members. However, in many instances, Thai neighbors help shield them from pro by providing information about police monitoring in the area. So they will not be able to, so they will not be subjected to arrests and detentions. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the informal structures of the community also play a vital role in spreading information about COVID-19 preventions and help and helping manage those getting infected. And this is a, the pictures from the mass at their church that they gathered every Sunday. Some part of the stories, such as the existence of the community elders may be unique to the Hmong community. However, based on interviews that my team and I conducted with refugees from 10 nationalities in 10 communities, the overall experiences of refugees are strikingly similar, ranging from the stories of their journeys into Thailand, people overstaying their visa and get to stay in Thailand more longer, to the stories of pathway to get employment and their experience of urban destitution. The story I just told you may also resonate with urban refugee experiences in other countries as well. If these stories are so common, why do I still mention them? I mention them because these stories bring me to the key puzzles for my talk today. How is refugee asylum in Thailand possible despite the hostile legal environment? How could we explain these phenomena? There are various factors, of course. Elsewhere, I did explain the role of the social network, the importance of the Thai government policies, and the existence of refugee organizations and UNSCR office. But what about the space where they live, like the city? How does the city shape and make refugee asylums possible? How should we understand the connection between the cities and refugees, especially their abilities to navigate livelihoods in the cities without legal status and rights? Personally, I think refugee scholars have taken the connections between the cities and refugees for granted and too lightly. They focus excessively on the relative advantages that the cities bring to refugees compared to those in camp, such as free mobilities, employment opportunities. I do not deny these explanations, but I believe that we can better theorize the refugees' cities' nexus, and this is what exactly I'm trying to accomplish by the end of, of this talk today. Therefore, I am trying to bring urban studies to contribute to refugee studies in my talk. To explain how refugees construct their asylums in the non-signatory states, my argument is as follows. The city's three forms of powers, including environmental, discursive, and mature powers, have bolstered the resilience of refugees by providing them with three essential capacities for city navigations, and through which it allows the refugees to be able to construct asylums, even in the context of a non-signatory state like Thailand. I will now introduce two interrelated concepts, which is central to my arguments and my explanations, urban power and refugee resilience. Urban power. For those of you who study urban politics and urban studies, the term is in no way new. For decades, we have seen the emergence of these other discussions about urban power. For example, in the famous book, Who Governs? by Robert Dowes, who taught here at Yale and wrote, and wrote about the cities of New Haven, also led us to understand urban power structure. From there, we also seen the growing literatures on urban power relations, power in the cities, or even cities of power, which is the title of a book by, um, by Therbon that just came out a couple of years ago. Power in the cities continue to be a recurring theme in urban affairs nowadays although some have moved on to talk about urban governance, for example. On the other hand, urban power is also discussed among sociologists and geographers who have looked into urban powers from a slightly different perspective. They seem to focus more on the power of place and space and the power of the cities and how they, these shape social relations and interactions. We often hear them proclaim place matters. We have seen the classic sociological work of Samson's on neighborhood effects, which attempts to explain how the neighborhoods can be an essential determinant of socioeconomic stratifications. For me, urban power relations, as well as social interactions 
are quite crucial for the construction of life and of the cities. I look into the work of a geographer like Robert Sack, who argued that the power of place and space comes only from the, in quote, territorial rules about what is in and our place. But again, who make those rules? It is those who govern that place and perhaps those who, those rules come from social interactions that give meaning to such a place. For this reason, these multiple social, political and economic relations eventually lend power to the city. It was from this urban power that new arrivals, for example, migrants or refugees could derive their resilience and integrate into the cities. Because of there are multiple forms of relations and governance in the cities, there can be various forms of urban power. Today, my talks will focus on only three forms, environmental, discursive, and, and material powers. Although urban powers can be elusive and sound abstract, I believe it would be worthwhile to define it as a form of power embedded in the cities emerging from complex relations that shape the dynamics of the cities and the city constructions. Second, the term refugee resilience. From a rather traditional concepts that I introduced just now, I would like to move on to discuss a more fashionable term resilience, which has been used widely in various fields. Generally, the terms refer to positive adaptations and capabilities to recover from challenges and setbacks quickly. Some scholars even treat resilience as a paradigm. In refugee studies, resilience is also very popular, especially among those studying refugee well-being and those focusing on livelihood adjustment and strategies. My usage of the term is also pretty straightforward. I adopt this term because I see it as more encompassing. For me, it is suitable because when we talk about resilience, we can look into two interconnected components of capacities. The first is to have capacities. And the second is connected to the abilities to use such capacities to make difference in the situations and life situations in particular. With the concept of resilience, it is also important to note that we can give agency back to refugees themselves. As many states often take that away from them and put them into a position of burden or dependence. In conceptualizing resilience, most literatures would focus more on resilience that come from within, meaning, meaning to look into their mental adjustment in the self and available resources and social network. But for me, when we think about resilience or refugee resilience in particular, especially in the context of urban refugees, resilience also come from the city itself. Different forms of urban power provide various capacities. And in my talk, you will see, which I'm gonna show you later on in, in the table, that um, from which sorts these resilience are coming from. Different forms of urban power provide various capacities. And to repeat my arguments again, the city three forms, which including material, discursive, and environmental powers, they have bolsters, materials, discursive, and environmental capacities. Now that I have laid foundations for my conceptual framework for the subject matters, please allow me to delve into details for each one of them, and then also to provide you with some empirical evidence. The empirical evidence which provide insights into what I'm presenting today is come from ethnographic fieldwork that I've been conducted in Thailand for the past three years, observing communities, activities, and engage with them, having conversations with um, dozens of local CSOs and also more than 140 interviews that my team and I conducted with refugees back in 2020. These interviews were conducted as part of attempts to understand refugee integration in Thailand, and it was conducted via telephone. We adopt this method since at that time, it was the beginning of the pandemic, and we were not able to get, to get into the, com the community. They were conducted over the period of four months between September and December 2020s, and a team of five people, including myself, we, we engage in this interview all together. Now, going into detail for each one of them, these are the form of urban powers that I'm talking about and the form of resilience that correspond with different urban powers. I start first from, I will start first with the first form of urban power, which is an urban environmental power, which is corresponding with the environmental capacities. When hearing the term environmental powers, people often go back to the, the work and the thinking of, of 
Thorstein Webern, who argue in the theory of the leisure class that environmental power emerged from how people demonstrate their command of the environment through their wealth and social positions. Environmental power, therefore, would become an indicator of social power. <coughs> Based on Webern's insights, these advantages people may also have environmental power if we think of this in the relative terms, but their power would be lesser to the wealthier and those with higher social positions. However, the critical questions we also have to ask is where is environmental powers comes from? Well, you need, you need access to the environment first to be able to command it. If that's the case, then this environmental power is not simply relative, but come from human interactions with the environment to amend or change the landscapes, build new structures. Through the social interactions that human has with the environment, it is unsurprising that power is also led to the restructured environment, also giving the environment the so-called power as well in turn, which can, be, be that, which can then be lent to anyone, including those with less power like refugees. Let me put this in more concrete terms of urban refugees. When I'm talking about the environment in this context, I'm talking mainly about the built environment. This is all the physical parts of where we live, rest, work, and perform, or engage in various activities in a city such as Bangkok. The built environment is, is complex. Buildings become a fortress where people can shield themselves from one another. These form of social interactions between humans and the built environment made the environmental power of the city very powerful. Authority cannot penetrate all areas unless there are reports from those living in those built environment. People can become invisible behind the concrete walls in their private apartment. These former urban powers therefore lend refugees the environmental capacities to make a decision, to command how they will use the built environment to shield themselves or enhance other social and economic benefits. Usually they will prioritize safety. Why? As I mentioned before, refugees are considered illegal migrants in Thailand. They can be arrested and detained. For example, one Palestinian family I visited will close their house door most of the time, whether they are inside or not. Sabiha always said to me, we always feel safer here in this house when we close the door. But actually the side of the house itself is also a very safe place because it's located in the gated communities of most Thai people. But being in the command of the environment made refugees feel a double layers of cell protections. The housing choice is also related to their access to a mosque and also job sites. However, it's essential to note that when a number of refugees moving into a community and other areas together, the city environmental powers may hinder the refugees' environmental capacities as well. There were several incidents of refugees getting arrested because of the neighborhood reported a high concentrations of foreigners or refugees living in the areas to local police. The second form of urban power that I will be discussing is discursive power. This form of powers, this form of urban powers emerged from the city's densities, varieties and diversities of people, places and space. The city has possessed this power perhaps since the city started to expand. We can trace back to the work of Worth on urbanism in 1938, where he talks about the heterogeneity of people in the cities and the later works of other urban sociologists who have discussed anonymities in the cities. What does it mean to the capacity of the people? The city provides capacities for refugees to move in and out of labels depending on place and space. In the context of this discursive powers, particularly in the context of Thailand, I'm talking about the new categories of people labeled as refugee migrants. Because of Thailand is a non-signatory state, as I mentioned before and always, Refugees are not recognized as refugees. Even those with UNSCR cards, they are known as a person of concern to UNSCR. And they prefer to identify themselves as migrants, especially to the locals who are potential employers. The urban discursive powers therefore allow refugees to de-link and re-link their own stories, making them in command of their labels. This is precisely what Stipotet and Sorensen say that refugees, in quote, have a very context-dependent and pragmatic relationship to their labels, end quote. 
In extreme cases, that's what I mentioned already. In extreme cases, urban discursive powers also allow some refugees to pass as time. Passing refers to the process by which in an, an individual can cross over from one identity to another based on specific attributes. In the case of urban refugees in Thailand, that is the Thai language fluencies combined with a similar physical appearance. Passing is a forceful form of discursive capacities urban refugees use to avoid getting arrests if police encounter them on the street or at the construction site. Alang, among refugees, for example, mentioned to me in quote, we look like Thai people and speak the language well, so we cannot get away, so we can get away with many things in Thailand, end quote. Last but not least, the material powers, which does not need much explanations. This is perhaps the most widely discussed connections between refugees and the cities. The urban material powers emerge from the economic relations in the cities. We have seen multiple economics um, theories of the cities, either it being the sire productions or the locus of class struggle. Economic relation helps structure urban material powers. This power in turn structures social relations between economic agents, namely employers and also employees. What the city yields to urban refugees in the case of Thailand is capacities in the economic realm or material capacities, which allows them to navigate employment and jobs opportunities and acquire material needs. Bank of Thailand approximates that size of the Thai informal economy is between 45 to 50% and has absorbed more than 60% of the workforce in the countries. Bangkok, as a country capital and economic and financial center of the countries, also serves as a major hub for the informal sectors. Our interviews reveal that Bangkok has provided various economic opportunities for refugees. The extent to which they could acquire those chances also varies depending on their skill, experiences, network, and connections. But let me show you some data that we found from 140 interviews that we did. 74% of the 140 respondents were engaged in income gathering activities in the informal sectors before the pandemic. 20% of all the respondents who reported working in Thailand had worked in at least two jobs. And respondent wages varies. Some wages could be as low as $1 per day for picking dry chili chips to others receiving up to 800 or around 20 US dollars per day working in organizations, depending on their skill required. Those low wages perhaps explain why they are working in multiple jobs. These data that I presented to you here show not only what a city like Bangkok can provide for urban refugees, but also the extent urban refugees have already contributed with their material capacities to the Thai economy and the cities, how the city urban power enabled them to have these particular capacities. However, the contributions of urban refugees in Bangkok are less known. Up to this point, I have already provided a detailed explanation of the interactions between urban powers and refugee resilience, focusing on three forms of capacities as I mentioned. And these urban powers and the corresponding forms of refugee capacities, which I frame them as a refugee's resilience, help make asylum possible for urban refugees, even in the context of a non-signatory state like Thailand. Although focusing on both factors, I just want to repeat it again, that I recognize the significance of some other factors that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Before I end this talk, I would like to address one final issue regarding the sustainability of asylums. Although cities like Bangkok can provide haven for refugees, the fact that refugees can settle their asylums with urban powers and resilience has also become a barrier for their onward moving, for their onward movement and limbo as a refugees. Let me now revisit the stories of the Hmong communities that I started. In June 2019, I visited Junior's family as usual. And this time I had a chance to discuss with his father, Pastor, for almost two hours. He told me that his family faced resettlement challenges. A sponsor in Canada told the pastors that he wants the sponsors, he wants to sponsor someone else who is really in need, since the pastor's family seems to be better off in Bangkok. The pastor told me with low voice, in quote, I was quite surprised that he said that to me. We are indeed better off economically in Bangkok 
But that is what we must do to survive. It, does, it also doesn't mean we would need protections. The Thai government didn't recognize our status, end quote. Because of the, ref, because of the resettlement uncertainties, the pastor is currently exploring other options for his families. One of them was to have Junior or another of his sons get resettled first, either in Canada or somewhere else. He's also preparing for the worst if the families and the communities must continue living in Thailand for years to come. And he said, in quote, God will pave our way, end quote. Being able to seek asylum is one thing, but moving to a third country is another. And the latter continue to be the hope of nearly all urban refugees in Thailand, despite knowing that the chance has become increasingly limited. As Thailand will soon launch its own national screening mechanisms, providing urban refugees with temporary legal status while seeking asylum in Thailand. It's also the time to see whether urban refugees will change their perceptions regarding asylum seeking in Bangkok. In fact, many do not merely seek asylum in the cities, but have already integrated into the Thai society in some way. Whether it is asylum or integrations, I believe that urban power and, and refugee resilience are part of the ingredients, making the livelihoods of these urban refugees continue to be a path of survival. I want to end my talk with some key implications. First, cities may be another factor contributing to refugee asylums, but it is indeed the essential one. Second, urban power plays a significant part in empowering refugee agencies and also enabling their resilience. Empowering refugees therefore require the empowerment of the cities and also the urban power. And finally, Although constructing asylums in the non-signatory states may be challenging, the case of urban refugees in Thailand that I show in my talk today indicates that it's possible. In fact, the possibility of asylum in some non-signatory states can be far greater than that in the signatory states. That's the end of my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Um, I am going to serve as a bit of a moderator. So if you have questions, maybe you can raise your hand. And um, uh, I think we have plenty of time. So you know yeah. we can take each one one by one, and you can go ahead and answer. And then if we sort of run out of things to discuss, I have some questions in sure. mind as well. So um, but I'll, I would love for you all to ask your questions first, if anyone wants to start. I'm, well, I'm happy to like use my, um, I guess my power as discussant to ask a question that I have. Yes. Um, and then maybe uh, that'll let everyone gather their thoughts. So um, one, I guess, just to sort of plow the field and make sure we're, we're using the same terms. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about um, why you as a researcher, as a kind of doing the political work you do, why you choose to call these individuals refugees, not migrants and not asylees, um, and why you don't adopt the term that the government uses of refugee dash migrant, refugee migrant. All right. Um, and related to that, I'm, I'm personally curious about the idea that um, uh, these, the urban refugees are um, seeking a space of asylum. Um, how does that differentiate from an asylee? Do you use those terms interchangeably or, yeah, um, just a little bit more information on how you conceptualize these different categories. Right. It's also fine if they're like not meaningful for you because of your work, but um, yeah, just so we're- Yeah, I, I think it's really important to actually go back and think about those terms as well, because of you know, the way I use the term, it's, it's quite different from-, from from some of the you know, like concepts I've been discussing elsewhere. So when I use the term refugees, it depends, and it's actually based on the self-identification mm -hmm. of the refugees themselves. So that's, that's how I, I, because of, for example, this talk, when I, even though I talk about urban power, right? Um, how I constructed uh, or focus on the three form of urban powers actually come from the data that I got from refugees themselves. So um, if they identify themselves as refugees, of course, I take it as a refugees. I will give you some example. For example, in the case of the Hmong community, there are a lot of people who are known as a closed case. These closed case are the people who are who used to go through the 
the process of seeking asylum, you know, and go through the ISD process with UNHCR. And then their case got closed, right? But but the fact that they, that the case got closed doesn't mean that they are not refugees. It means that because of perhaps they don't have enough documents or evidence to actually prove at that time being, and they can go through the process again, right? So because of this, I feel like it, it wouldn't do justice to them if we identify it, it elsewhere in, in, in some other ways, you know, like for example, or in the way the Thai government would identify refugees. So in the case of Thailand, refugees actually known in, in, in multiple ways. Like for example, um, the early groups of refugees that came into Thailand, they were known as the displaced Vietnamese, displaced Laos and so on and so forth. The more recent group from Myanmar, right? Also known as um, people fleeing, um, uh, of people fleeing fighting. That was the first time, the first, the first group that came in 1980s and 90s. And then the, the recent groups, it's known as people fleeing um, uncertainties, for example, right? So it's a whole bunch of category, but then at the end of the day, you know, I feel like all these terms, it just related to the policies that governing them but it doesn't do justice to the, the actual identities of refugees themselves. That's the first thing. Second thing, when I use the term refugees, migrants, though, right, that was the time that I also recognized that if, you know, like refugees want to define themselves differently when they are talking about different contexts, like for example, in the context of employment, right, in that case, I also use the term migrant as well. So it, it really depends, the way I describe it, it really depends on how they, they actually uh, use the terms, you know, basically. And for the term asylums, I, 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 the second questions, I haven't thought about that much yet, but it, I, I often use it interchangeably with some other terms. And other terms I use often as well is refuge. But then in these presentations, because I feel like the, the term refuge, it means that, you know, like it, 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 it gives a sense of how, how there will be some structures that govern them in some way still, right? And, and to a large degree, it's related to the UNSCR structures. But in the term asylum that I, I chose here, it's more like how it comes from the way that refugees themselves can draw on, on their capacities to build it. So that's why I prefer this term more in presenting this today. Yeah. Hopefully I answer both questions. Yes, you did, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for this talk, it was really interesting. Um, I guess I, I have two sort of very different questions. The first is why Thailand has not signed onto the 1951 convention um, and what discussion is taking place around that mm -hmm. and, and in the government. And then the second one is um, just wondering about the way that you use resilience and if you're engaging with critical like um, criticism of that term, right? Because a lot of folks, um, particularly advocates of marginalized people have talked about the way that resilience um, focuses on people and on their behavior instead of on structures mm -hmm. that are constraining them or producing vulnerability, right? And so I wonder how you kind of reconcile with that. Okay, let me go start from the, the first question, why Thailand is not signing the conventions. Um, I have to trace back the history of refugee management in Thailand. And actually it's about politics of um, how Thailand sees its positions way back in 1950. So in 1950, actually the early groups of refugees that came to Thailand are the KMT soldiers that came from China during that time. And there were, there were a, lot of, a lot of them were settled there. But at the same time, during that period of time, um, there was also a dispute in um, the uh, ICJ regarding one of the territories of Thailand that related to Cambodia. Um, I think this is part of the reasons why in, in the calculations of the Thai government at that time, that you know, like they, first, they don't want to hold responsibilities of taking care of refugees. That's the first thing. But second thing is that because of they're afraid of the, uh, the binding you know, like of the obligations that were related to the case at the ICJ at that time also. That was the historical reasons. But then in the modern periods, there have been four times that there was research conducted on should Thailand you know, sign the conventions? And all the research that came out say that Thailand should not sign the convention and they're gonna do the fifth one very soon, actually, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they're gonna sign the conventions. But the arguments right now is that because of the content in the conventions are no longer related to the real world situations, it's not up to date basically, right? And Thailand always have one argument, which I think that also resonates with some other countries that we do more already than the signatory states. Why should we do 
um, the conventions. For example, one of the examples that Thailand will use likely in this December Refugee Forum is that we already you know, creating the national screening mechanisms. And with this mechanism, this could be a, re a, a replacement of, of the conventions, right? So that's the that's kind of thing that, that Thailand feel that you know, like if the refugee conventions get updated, and then we also have some other thing else you know, that we already doing. So then that, unless that, that updated version is there, then we would sign the conventions. Otherwise, they would not, would not agree to sign the conventions, I, I believe. And they don't see this, the, 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 the importance of it also um, in terms of that. Nevertheless, saying that doesn't mean that Thailand does not really oblige to the international you know, like responsibilities at all, because there are some other um, instruments that make Thailand you know, taking care of refugees also. And what's more important also is that if you look into the text of the national screening mechanisms, which I mentioned, the definitions of our persecutions and also the definition of refugees, it's expanding. It goes beyond the definitions in the conventions. So in that case, you know, like it, it, it's quite progressive in the sense, but then we have to see whether in the interpretation of it, will it retain that progressiveness or not? Um, so that's to answer the questions on, on the signing of the conventions. The term resilience, yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting the way you ask the questions because of, I, I have to admit that I did not engage much with the, the critical side of that yet. And then I, I try to go along with the mainstream in itself. But when I think about the resilience here, as I mentioned, it's also related to the capacities of them in itself. Um, and it's the lending from the structures that resilience emerge, right? So I'm not talking about resilience of the structure in itself, but I'm talking about how the power within the structure, like urban, urban power, is the one that lend this resilience to the capacity. So it, it, at the end of the day, still focus on, on the people themselves and how they be able to, to, to have that capacities. But then when I'm talking about the capacities here, the reason why I decided to use the term resilience, at first when I started off this paper, I didn't use the term resilience. I using the term capacities. But then one of my colleagues, criticize that usage in the way that when you think about capacities alone, you are assuming that they just have it, but you're not talking about how they actually be able to spring back. But in the case of refugees, you know, it's not just having capacities, but they use these capacities to make something else happening for them. And that means the livelihood possibilities and so on. So in this case, that's why I, I go to the term resilience and I go with the term resilience for that reason to also extend um, the, the part of, of capacities from not just having capacities, but to focus on how they use the capacities to construct their asylums, basically. There is a question from uh, somebody um, on Zoom, and I'll read that. If urban power, especially the built environment and environmental power is considered to be a central component of refugee resilience in a city with such host, uh, hostile environment, to what extent do development projects like stream cleanups and other physical uh, changes to the city affect this power? Are there any pathway for refugees or their advocates to be a part of city planning at this point? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think in some, I think this is really depends on the context. Now, this is where the context gonna matter a lot. In the case of Bangkok right now, I think that refugees are being part of the construction of the cities. Because of one of the key jobs that several refugee groups are engaging is actually the construction of the cities, the construction work and so on. And if you look into the, the survey, I mean, in, in other published work of mine on, on, their human on, on their human capitals, it shows that most of them identify construction as being their own skill that they already have. So in, in that sense, you know, in terms of being engaged in the construction of the cities, in the way of the, create, the creation of the built environment, they were part of it. But now in terms of the city planning, this is another question that refugees, at least in the context of Thailand, they're not able to do so yet. And the reason why, we, because of, of course, you know, they have the lack of legal status. And because of the lack of legal status, it means that they are not, they are, they are also um, afraid of even going out, you know, like to be exposed or to be visible most of the time. And because of the, the, the fear of being visible in that sense, it leads them you know, like to not be to taking part in terms of you know, planning or engaging in policies. Second thing, not all groups of refugees engage or speak Thai language. 
right? It, only a certain groups of, of them that really do speak Thai. And because of this, you know, like it, it also part of the reasons why refugees will not, you know, really um, engage in that kind of planning and so on. And most of them, you know, still dream of transit through Thailand. The transit word is a term that, that in, in, in the world of Cuttington's, it, it's got constructed to different um, factors and so on. But, but it also in the imagination of refugees themselves that they want to transit through Thailand and go somewhere else. And because of the, 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 the thinking about transiting to, through Thailand and to go somewhere else, it made them less engaged politically or in terms of planning of the cities and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, because of the resettlement opportunity become limited, nowadays um, several refugee organizations within the countries, particularly local CSO, engage more in, in empowering refugees so that they can be part of this city planning. But then, I, I mean, in some other cases, perhaps I think it, it may be viable, but in the case of, you know, in the context of Bangkok at the moment, I don't think that it's the case yet. Yeah. And, and then a follow up from that, are children, for example, allowed to go to school? Uh, like, so, so what happens to the next generation, basically? Right. And how um, yeah. Do they consider or view themselves? This is the most important question. So one thing is that refugees in Thailand can go to school all children can go to Thai school. And it's, it's, it's guaranteed in the constitutions that all kids in the country, regardless of what race, ethnic cities they are, they can go to school. But then when you go to school, the school also teach everything in the Thai language, right? So that's part of the reason why some of them do not, do not go to Thai school. And then because of some of them want to just make a transit and not make a living in Bangkok. So they decided not to send their kids to the school. That's the decision to refugee themselves. Second thing was that it's also about the structures. When refugees go into the Thai school, what happened is that sometimes the principals may make decisions not to admit them into school, or even if they're already in the school, they don't allow or encourage them to continue their studies in a higher level by not giving them, for example, the certificate, right? So it's a challenge. It's not simply just in terms of, you know, the access is already there, but how the maneuvering of the, behind it it, it's become something that bar the access. And at the same time, for them to actually climb up the ladders and become successful within the context of Thailand, it also limited because of, because of that structure in itself. Nevertheless, one, one good news that is coming in from the case of Thailand is that um, if you look into the, the Convention on the Right of Children, um, Thailand is the last country in the world to reserve um, Article 22, which is focused specifically on the rights of the refugee children. So this year, it's, it's, it's a year that Thailand is trying to you know, withdraw from that particular articles. And I have the opportunities to be able to take part in that process as well. So they are, they are laying the groundwork to plan for the withdrawal from the, the, the CRC 22, uh, Article 22. So that should provide a pathway for children um, to integrate more into Thailand and to get more support for them. Yes, Marcus. Um, yeah, so I, I have two questions. One is about, uh, I was really struck by your use of like environment, uh, particularly like speaking about the urban environment, because like from the perspective of um, environmental history, it's quite separate from urban history where the urban is not considered as part of the environment. Um, so I'm just wondering like, how does nature figure in the kind of research that you do, especially thinking about um, questions of refugee narratives of um, like landscape, memory, and place, like place making, um, you know, like because they are displaced, they probably come from a kind of different landscape than the Bangkok urban environment. Like how does that change their experience or how do they negotiate with that? Mm -hmm. um, the second question that I have, if, uh, that I have is um, uh, how does your, this research like relate to um, like current studies of globalization and refugees? Like I'm thinking specifically about like the work of Gordon Matthews and um, and about like Chunking Mansions, um, the ghetto of the end of the world, uh, the center of the world, um, where you know that in that particular example, Hong Kong is both aspirational um, for the kind of middle class in developing countries, um, but also um, but also ma they are marginalized right within Hong Kong society. So is there a kind of similar? dynamic that is played out in your research you, uh, that you observe. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much, Marcus. So let, let me start from the first questions. To think about the change of the, of the experience, actually, you know, one thing that I find is so interesting was that because of 
as I mentioned in the stories, you know, at the beginning of the Hmong community, right? Once they move to Thailand, and the lack of legal status, lack of access to justice, for example, what would be the alternative? Then that is the time when they adopt, you know, like the structure, the social structures that they had already in their home countries over into Thailand. So it, it's kind of the, the, the replications of that structure that already at play there. But at the same time, you know, they also they also try to match it with the context that is also already different. Okay, that, that's the first, the, the second part of the first question that I answered. The thing that I think about environment, I think that, you know, when you think about environment, it, it's, there are multiple dimensions to environment, right? When we, when, we, when we hear about the word environment, of course, we think about the forest, the forest, the nature, and so on. But, but then if you think about the second dimension or the second phase of the environment, it, it's something around us here. It could be rhetorical in a sense, right? Or if you think about the third environment, it could be something that got described somewhere and so on. So there are multiple ways or multiple dimensions to the terms environment itself. And the way I use it, it's to, to focus it more like it based on not just the nature, but the, the amending of the nature in the way that allows everything else to be built on that nature. So nature may be there as a ground and so on and so forth. But on, on top of that, it, it got those built environment that, that, that become part of my explanations. So I hope that I answers most of the, uh, the first question, both parts of the first question. The second question is in terms of marginalization, yes. The answer is yes, that they got marginalized within the cities. And most of the time, many of them were pushed into poverty. So if you see, I, I did not show you the data that, 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 I, that I gathered from the interview, um, the 140 interviews that I did. It was the case that um, most of the refugees themselves after COVID-19 hit really hard. They were pushed out of the jobs. So they no longer have it at all. Like even some of the home base and, and, and workshop and so on, and they were they become more dependent than ever on um, on 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 AIDS. Nevertheless, you know it's not all the communities are the same. Some communities that have a strong structure that they imported from the 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 the, the, the home countries, like for example, the Hmong community, their resilience was was still going strong and very well. They can spring back pretty quickly, right? So in that case, you know, like I think the degree to marginalizations, it depends on the degrees in which they integrate into the societies and how they expand the network based on that integrations. So it's, it's, it's come down to that questions. And then I think that we cannot say that, oh, our group of urban refugees are destitute. I mean, there are groups that are really, really marginalized comparing to the others. So it's a matter of degrees, I think, to a large extent. Yeah. We have now a question from uh, Adeline. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I wish I, wish I was there. Um, so just to follow up on this, I had I had a couple of questions. So the first was about this in question about integration, right? So between Thai and Hmong people, um, I'm wondering how how do they ne negotiate the identity? You mentioned that they were able to speak very good Thai, Hmong, and in different languages. I'm wondering, you know, to what extent do they navigate this identity issue in a sense of like, do they believe in, um, you know, some like Buddhist like Thai customs or practices? Do they bring in their Hmong kind of practices as well? To what extent do they conceive of nature in a way that, you know, Thai people would versus Hmong people? Um, because for example, when I was talking to Hmong people um, in, in, in Northern Thailand, they had very different conceptions of like causality for like natural disasters and, and how to then uh, address that. Um, and for example, the very the different animistic ways of dealing with, with um, uh, understanding the world. I'm just curious to what extent they integrate, you know, in, in their kind of metaphysical as well as kind of like identity uh, practices and language. Um, sorry, the second question was about power. Um, and in Thai studies, there's this kind of like tension between Barami and Amnat, right? This idea about kind of like a moral power versus like an authority over something. Does that figure into this form of power or is it more a different from a power like Kwam Samad or a capability that you're seeing as an empowering uh, term. I'm just wondering how this term of power relates between the languages, or I, I don't speak Hmong, but uh, maybe something that they might be thinking about as well. And sorry, the last question is about networks. Um, so you mentioned in the material power section in the informal economy that opportunities depends on networks, skills, and connections. And I think there's a very interesting parallel with um, uh, Indra's paper. She, she did a journal article on Thai Karen, and she talks about amid their legal precarity, they have the sense of uh, uh, resilience through their networks, right? So I'm wondering for these Hmong people, what, what are their networks like? What is a good network? What is not a good network? How are they you know, bringing in their social structures or not? Um, and what, what that looks like? Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much, Al. Um, because of the question is focused more on the Hmong community and then as my talk, you know, like feature both of with this particular community, both at the beginning and at the end. So I, I, will, I will first have to mention about the network itself. The network is the most important part of their resilience. I mean, particularly for the Hmong community because of these networks, because of it, it comes not simply just because of they are already in Bangkok, but it started actually over a long period of time. That's not even before they moved into Thailand, they already known some of the people, you know, like within the Hmong community. And then they all, already have a separated groups of the Hmong communities, you know, like across Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam, and they're known among themselves, right? So this network was fostered not just simply because of they moved into Thailand and they found that, that network, but then they're they known about this network for quite some time. And perhaps this is part of the reasons why they integrated into, um, into, um, into Thailand for that reason also, or come to Thailand that, for that reason. The, the second thing that I really have to mention about the network that they have is that if you look or, or you pin into the employment opportunities that they be able to gather, particularly for the Hmong community, it's actually also in the historic areas where the Hmong people used to stay, including the Lao Hmongs that came into Thailand, like for example, in the areas near Saraburi province and so on and so forth. So that's, for example, once they have no job opportunities in Bangkok, some of the people would go into those areas in, in order to get the, the, the opportunities and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of the identity itself, I don't think that I can comment more specifically on the language because of one of the things that, that I, I have to say is that um, on the language part, I, I communicate with the Hmong people through in the Thai language because of they already, as I mentioned, integrated in, the, in, in Thailand to a large degree. So the way that they express themselves or, or talk to me, right, it's always in, in, in the Thai language itself, but behind the scenes, whether or not how they reconcile it, with um with uh with the that one language and that one cultures, I cannot mention more specifically on that. Um, and also in terms of the last part of the of questions of power, the question of power is in terms of the moral powers and so on and so forth that I I already mentioned. Also, I I haven't thought about that much yet. So perhaps that's the reason why I haven't included in this presentation for today. So I cannot comment more specifically on that on that part also for the time being. But then that would let me think more about it because of that was one idea that came out from the, the notions of moral power that you know like even though like when it comes to the policy of managing refugees in Thailand, there would be some form of the moral powers that kind of that that kind of was of, of, of being used you know like in order to to actually allow these people to stay in, in the countries. I, I got that got mentioned several times already to me, but nevertheless I haven't never get a chance to really delve into details of those. So I, I cannot comment more specifically on that. Oh, sorry. I would be interested in, in asking you to pick up on the last point that you mentioned. Um, I guess it was the second to last about intersectionality and the different identities of yeah. these groups, both in relation to uh, before when we met earlier, we talked briefly about, you know, these groups span Somali mm -hmm. um, refugees, refugees from Pakistan, um, and then refugees from neighboring countries. So the kind of experience of moving through the city yes. for those different groups must be very different but also maybe you could speak a bit on on gender um uh other anything else that feels significant to you in in terms of what impacts the way that people wield this power that you've identified differently i think that it, it's really important to mention intersectionalities i didn't bring it in into my discussions here at first because it's not related directly to the powers but then of course i mean this urban power is not shared um, equally among different groups of people so different groups of people draw different um it, it, i mean the capacity that they can draw from these urban powers is kind of diverse and different depending on the groups for example with, with, in, with regards to the somali right as, as you mentioned somalis always get spotted within the thai societies partially because of you know like they they look different in comparing to like Hmong people or some other groups that are from neighboring countries, right? So the chance for them to actually integrate it into a Thai society is, is limited comparing to other groups. And then whenever they gather together in certain groups, in certain areas, they always get spotlight. And then that's how, you know, the arrests and detentions of these groups are become more, are become something that, that got more commons. And, and then in many cases, I mean, many incidents, you know, of the arrests and detentions that occur with the groups of African um, refugees, it occurred through the fact that because of the Thai immigration bureaus um, try to label, you know, like some operations that focus specifically on smuggling and so on and so forth of these groups of people into Thailand. And because of this, what happened is that they become victims of that, you know, like arrests and detentions and so on also. Um, so in, in terms of the, the intersections of being, you know, like, um, 
uh, and then and then that that's just on the ethnic ethnic cities part only. But now you know another thing that's more important though is that if we think about gender and race also together, right? What is, what 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 become clear to me also is that it also matters in the way that how they got treated and so on and so forth. Like for example, in, in the case of Thailand, even though the arrests mostly occur when it comes to the, the male refugees, when it comes to female refugees, right? The, the, the chance or the livelihoods of getting, getting arrested is it, it, less. And when it comes to other groups, um, the LGBTQI+, their, their livelihoods in Thailand is also very difficult, particularly if they live together with people from their own community. Why? Because of... Um, most of these people, you know, they imported the same social structure from their own countries, right? One of the Somali refugees who are the LGBTQI that I met, for example, got expelled from the community and also experienced violence um, within Thailand as well. But then he cannot access to justice, justice. So the only way out for him is to escape from the community and go and stay somewhere else, for example, right? So in that case, you know, like these multiple identities of the people also have an impact on how they're going to be able to survive within the cities. And even, even though, you know, like they already survive, it doesn't mean that that's going to be the case in the upcoming years and so on and so forth. So I think to think more about intersectionalities in the context of livelihoods, I think it's important. And then I think that I haven't done that well enough here in these presentations today, because I think that different groups really draw on the, the powers differently. So at the end of the day, the degree to refugee resilience, which is if these different capacities, also varies in degree as well, yeah. Questions? So I think if you join me in, uh, thank you, Professor Khan for Vityank uh, for visiting us and it's a pleasure to have you here in person. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank you so much for having me here. <laughs>